Hi, everyone. I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. I'm here with my friends, guys in practice, uh, Dan Ricciardi in Brooklyn, Herb Baraff in Maryland. Gentlemen, how are you? We're good. Thank you. Great. Very All good. All right. So let's start off by telling us what your biggest challenge has been in the last six weeks. Herb, why don't you go first? Uh, well, the biggest challenge of doing telehealth after the adjustment is basically to connect because uh, sometimes you're spending 25 minutes on the phone trying to get them to get the video working. And you're going from platform to platform. We use doxy.me, sometimes FaceTime, Doximity, sometimes WhatsApp. That's the sometimes just the telephone and a lot of hair pulling. I had a full head of hair before this began. <laughs> you know, what you just described in about 15 seconds really is the script of what we've been doing for the last 30 minutes, trying to connect with each other in our own technology. Right. So. If we're having troubles, they're having troubles. Not to mention yesterday. <laughs> yesterday, we will talk about our problems. Yesterday, oh, we did this whole thing. We did a recording <laughs> we, did a, <laughs> <some push. laughs> we did a whole recording yesterday, and at the end, they said, oh, gentlemen, guess what? <laughs> it didn't record. <laughs> we're we're going to come back and try it again, take two. That was just uh, that was a dry run, a rehearsal. Um, <laughs> you know, Danny, what, what's your biggest challenge? Well, my biggest challenge is, uh, unlike most, I would say half my pa patients do not have access to, you know, what we have access to, and it's a big problem. You know, these are all the people, 75 plus, you know, middle, you know, working middle class people with the heart and soul of this country, and they got a flip phone maybe, but that's about it. And and uh, and and those who have children with them will help them, but it's, you know, it's a challenge. You know, actually, I've seen some 93-year-olds just go on like that as compared, and typically on a snow day here in the Northeast, I'm in Washington, uh, when there's ice on the ground, it's the 90-year-olds that come in, it's the 37-year-olds stay home. Sometimes you get that same dichotomy with connecting on telehealth. Tell me you haven't had this happen to you. You're, you call and say, Mrs. Schwartz, is it okay to do a telephone visit or televideo visit? She says, sure, I'm driving. <laughs> you're on the freeway how am I going to do a joint exam I mean it's already crazy enough as it is you know but I, I'm interested in what Danny said and I want to hear a little bit more about Danny what your plan is you know people who can't come in you know people well, who don't have the technology I mean, they just can't do it what's the what do you just have to come and see them live what are you doing well no I, we try to we try the telephone we try some uh uh you know, FaceTime you know some of them do have you know, iPhones. Uh, but if not, you know, if they really, I think I know them well enough that I could talk to them on the phone, just plain talking on the phone and, and, and to treat them. And if they really need to come in, uh, then we have to make arrangements for them to come in on a, uh, on a half hour basis. So there's no overlap. Uh, but the biggest issue that we have in New York City is that a lot of these people do not drive. They take public transportation or something called accessoride. And that's where you just sit in a bus with a whole bunch of sick people. So we don't want them doing that. <laughs> and it takes six hours to get from, from their home to the office and back. So, but they only charge you you know, the price of a subway. So. And people are, people are scared. So they're afraid to go out. And, uh, you know, this is a big boon. I think Medicare uh, got it right. Uh, one of the few times in, in my 40-plus year career that Medicare actually did the right thing by uh, by lowering the barriers, making it easier. And recently, they just equated uh, telephone calls with uh, audiovisual calls in terms of reimbursement to make it easy for patients to get access. Realizing that access has been a big problem, uh, and people don't want to leave their homes. Herb, you've been on a lot of ACR committees, Danny. You too. Um, but um, uh, uh, especially around government affairs and whatnot, what are the things you surprised about in transition that they've done right? You know, so obviously reimbursement and allowing for telephone video to be the same as, you know, a, a 99443 telephone visit for 30 minutes is the same as a 99214, you know, uh, in-person visit. But what else have they gotten right in this, uh, in the last few weeks? Well, they, they, they dropped all the HIPAA restrictions that, uh, that hogtie us in, try, in terms of trying to deal with patients and communicate. You know, we're off site. We got to talk to our office, or our offices are a bunch of people. And we're, we got onto a Microsoft Teams platform to communicate with one another because you got to coordinate labs and x ray and the telehealth visit itself. And 
uh, uh, HIPAA is so constraining that um, it really gets in the way of patient care. So by saying that and also saying they're not going to audit these calls uh, takes a big burden off of our shoulders because you can just document what you need to and not whether your patient is still wearing a bicycle helmet in their 90s, you know, which... And, is, and, and what you put down on the EMR is a lot less uh, restri constrictive than what you normally would have to do. You know, there are, I mean, there's restrictions to all of this in terms of you don't know what the vital signs are. You don't, you know, you, and basically, you know, you've been in practice 40 years, I'm 36 years. You know, you can tell just by looking at a patient how they're doing. So, you know, especially with lupus patients, rheumatoids, you know, rheumatoids you can deal with a lot on the phone because if you're doing the right thing, they're, they're stable and, they're, you know, they're chronic conditions. It's getting them their medicines and following up with that is, you know, I find more problematic than actually seeing them. How many patients have you seen face-to-face -face in the last two weeks? Dan? 20. That's it. But I've restricted it. You know, I've restricted it. I I'm not going. 20, no, no, I'm sorry, Jack. I did 20 charts. <laughs> so, and I left about another 11, 12. So about 32. Face-to-face? <laughs> -face. Yeah. Yeah, face-to-face. -face. I haven't gone in at all. I haven't gone in since the 24th of March. Okay. Um, we have one person in each of our offices. Um, one office, we have two people. And I'll send, I'll send in the joint injections and uh, 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 patients who need films, but I haven't seen, and I can look at their films remotely. So, Herb, you're an old Walter Cocker. You, you have to worry about going in, you understand? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, I'm on, the, I'm on the other side of what? Uh, the other side of 67? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, that's, uh, we, we're both senior citizens collecting Medicare. But, <laughs> but uh, no, it's... And the only reason why I go in, you have a group. I'm, I'm the dinosaur. I'm the last of the, you know, the solo practice. I think there's two left in Brooklyn, me and one other person. So I have to go in. But the beauty of it is I have the, the folks who work in my office. One girl comes in just to do all the authorizations for the, you know, for the biologics. One woman comes in just to take, just to listen to them. You know, so we, every day we have somebody there except Friday. You know, we try to play Shabbos on Friday. So, yeah, we're doing the same thing. <laughs> We've been doing uh, one day a week where the, the, someone's in the office in our clinic, but in the future, we're going to have it, and we have a, the university, we have a bunch of clinics and whatnot. It's going to be where there, every day there's going to be someone in the office to cover an urgent visit or a joint injection or some kind of face-to-face uh, -face service. Um, uh, so I, I don't think that we need to be back at work yet, especially while the numbers are going up. Only in New York are they coming down. It's still not a good thing in New York. But the rest of the country, the numbers are going up, and uh, I think it's a little premature to try to go back to work. Survey today said that patients don't want to come in. Uh, people are two thirds of people are, are wary of getting out and trying to resume activities. So uh, there's going to come a time that could be soon, but we just don't know when that's going to be. I want to go to uh, go ahead, Dan. Well, what do you say? You want question about that, Jack? What do you think is going to happen? Yes, they don't want to come back because they got nice. You're talking to them on the phone. You're talking to them like this. What happens when they, for a straight Medicare patients, when they start getting that 20% bill? Am I going to be charged with, you know, it's a little different. You know, these all, <laughs> think about that. So on a, on a four visit, you know, it's going to cost them 20, 25. Doctor, you talked to me on the phone. I didn't see you. You didn't touch me. You think I have to pay you? Think about that one. We haven't seen that wave come yet, but I'm telling you, it's coming very soon. Herb, what do you think is going to happen with that? <laughs> I think, well, you know, the, the trick in, in practice is to collect what's owed you. And, uh, you know, as a solo practitioner, you know that. I'd say most, most of the junior members of my group are not quite as aware as the older members of the group when we were a small group and dependent on cash flow, uh, much more dependent on cash flow. You've got to collect, and patients will say that. He never touched me, and uh, yeah. I don't know why I owe him anything. It was a telephone call. What, you know, leave me alone. So... <laughs> So the, the economic model works under this stressful situation, but uh, it, it may not. I, I think it's gonna be slow for, uh, for patients to start coming back in, even when the numbers are way down. You know, New York City, for example, people have been traumatized, but they're not gonna wanna leave their homes unless they absolutely have to. But we have learned that it's the voice and maybe the eyeballing uh, in this two-way video thing 
that, uh, that patients um, respond to. And we feel, you know, if you're following somebody who's on Fosamax, what, what do you really need to do except make sure they're tolerating it and they're taking it and, uh, and they're doing what they're supposed to do? There's nothing to examine in truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of the visits that we do that way. We're just looking for safety for the meds that we give them. So, call some max. Come on, you should. Be. <laughs> let me ask you about the assessing patients. Danny uh, correctly said, "We know our patients. We know, you know, and who you can with well, the the subtle hits on on one patient, and you have to pay attention to, and others that you know that they have too many hints to pay attention to, and uh, and then new patients that you're going to see, too right?" Many hints. <laughs> and the question is, you know, how is the joint exam working? You know, I was really worried about this. I put a video up on how to do a video joint exam. And I got to tell you, my experience over the month has been, you know, for the most part, it's pretty effective. I can see that they pretty much have nothing or not enough to get too worried about. And the ones I'm worried about have such obvious, you know, swollen PIPs and MCPs that I know I'm going to start therapy with methotrexate or whatever. But, you know, I think that the assessment part hasn't been all that difficult. And that's been a surprise to me. What's your experience? Well, you know, it's funny. I was on a conference call with, uh, uh, with United Rheumatology uh, Monday, and uh, this question came up about disease activity measures. And uh, Joseph Smolin and Daniel uh, Elataha were, were on the line because they had done this sort of self-examination uh, study because apparently it really doesn't matter whether the patient self-examines for swelling and, and tenderness or the doctor examines that the the differences are really not all that great, and it doesn't matter whether the patient is trained or not trained. Um, I I'm more of a gestalt person, so I'm not really driven by those numbers. And um, you know, it, it always surprises me in doing clinical trials. Uh, um, I'd um, I'd guess where the patient put themselves on the visual analog scale, and I was usually pretty close to where they were in terms of how severe they, they were affected by their arthritis, really based prior to examining them, based on, on what they were telling me, uh, how they were answering my questions. So, uh, I, 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 let me, Dan, wait a second. I just want to say a few things about the research on, on this point. Um, I've heard what Smolin and, uh, and Dan have said, um, but the research on patient self-exams has been a lot of it. And actually, I, and I looked at this, I've done this uh, in my own practice with a measure I use called the GAS, which relies on tender joint counts, not swollen joint counts. And then I've compared it to the PGAS, the patient GAS, which has the patient do their joint exam. Patient joint exams and physician joint exams only agree to a pretty good amount, like a, a correlation coefficient of seven, um, only for tender joints, not for swollen joints. There, there, there's total discordance there. And then the last point about patient globals and physician globals, uh, there are a lot of patients where they really do coincide. The more severe the patient and the more comorbidities the patient, the more they don't coincide. And there's a problem there, but it is, the, it is what you got. Good, Dan. I, I, you know, no, no, what I'm saying, I, I, go, I invented the Brooklyn hack and I, and I always- Brooklyn hack, what is that? <laughs> How you feeling today, Mo? <laughs> Show me your hands. Show me the money. You get up this morning. Let me admit. I you know, thought I invented that. <laughs> What's that? I What's thought that? I invented I was in Brooklyn before you. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I have to tell you, so, you know, before we had DOS, before we, we were doing it. So, and I think from our perspective, we've trained, you can look at somebody and, and, and tell them and, and see if they're hurting or not. It just, you know, in five, 10 questions, you could really... Get your own DOS score, get your own hack score without going through, uh, without touching every joint. You know, Roy Flashman is the funny one. Oh, I do this, but you know, I do this. But, uh, Roy, come on, Roy, who are you talking to? You know, <laughs> he's the original Brooklyn guy. So, <laughs> he's, he's, wait, he's, he's, Brook, he's, he's Bronx. Oh, oh, he's, the Bronx. oh, he's Brooklyn. Is he Brooklyn? Uh, yeah, yeah, he went to Downstate. He went to Columbia Downstate. You were in his class? No, no, he was ahead of me. Yeah, okay. Well, he was there before me. I don't know about the ahead of me. All right, so let me ask you this. In the future, you know, when all this is over, and we'll get to when all this is over later, when this is all, all over, will you use this video and telephone uh, interface more than what you used to use in the past, especially if you can get paid for it? What do you think, Dan? 
Oh, absolutely. You know, it, 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 why would you? You could actually close your office one day, do it from your home, okay? Hang out with your grandchildren, okay? And, and you know, have a margarita at five o'clock and you're good. You know, you don't have to travel. You, you don't have to deal with, you know, 9,000 different things in the office. So it has a value. I don't think it has a long-term value. I mean, you know, making it your, your solo practice. But yeah, it, it actually, for, for folks our age who are on the downside, it's a wonderful thing. You can stay active and not really, you know, work as hard in a sense. Yeah, but if you're in your 30s or 40s and you're on the, the upswing, yeah. uh, I don't think these telephone visits are anywhere near as efficient as face-to-face -face visits. Um, well, it doesn't build symbiosis with the patient. You know, you have to understand something. You know, it's, it's, you got to understand, there's a certain touch that you develop with people a long time, just like, just by going like this to the patient and knowing you care for them, some empathy. And, right. and I don't know how much empathy you could get on these things. Do, do you, so the, I mean, we can do this if we've been successful at it and Danny makes a case for doing it in the future. Uh, Herb, you think this works from an economic model and the way practices are run? No, no, I don't. Well, you know, we're a practice that's large and we're, we're sort of a one-stop shop so we have laboratory and x-ray and uh, ultrasound and bone density testing and frankly being not being in the office is a tremendous from an economic vantage point and from a thoroughness vantage point you lose a lot well, you lose a lot you lose revenue but you really lose sight of what's going on with your patient this is not a good long-term plan it i think it will be ancillary to the basic care that we give, and hopefully the payers will allow it under certain circumstances or a certain amount of it. But I, I, I really think being able to examine a patient, if they need an, an injection, do it there and then, or if they need an x-ray, get it. It's a much better way to manage these patients and to take care of them. So uh, I, totally, I totally agree. You know, I think this is, this is good if somebody can't make it to the office, or a chronic rheumatoid has to work or does something, got a problem. But you can't make it a habit because what happens is everybody get used to the easy way. I mean, we've been doing this a long time. And that, yeah, that's going to be a problem. The uh, um, a study just came out this week about um, American hospitals are going to lose $50 billion a month. Month, yeah. A total of $200 billion between March, April, May, June up to July 1st. That's the projection and they think it's pr it's pretty spot on. That's just in hospitals. You know, we're going to be feeling that as well and and um, it's going to be interesting as we flip, go forward. The flip side, United Healthcare just announced they're going to pay 100 uh, 1.5 billion. Uh, when they're going to pay it, they're going to forgive that much in terms of premiums. So, and you know, their stocks doing great because uh, they know that there's a lot of medical care that's not happening. Not just the hip replacements and the knee replacements, but the sore throats and the, the, the short injections. You ever huh? see open emergency, the emergency room visits? Do you realize- You're way down. Do you realize what it costs somebody to go to the, an insurance company to go to an emergency room for an, an abdominal pain? They charge 12,000. I mean, 12, uh, at least she went there, she had an abdominal, $12,000 for a CT of the abdomen and they pay. So, so, so the bill to go to the emergency room is 20 grand just for, for belly pain. Yeah. So, so I, I'm, you know, my heart bleeds for the insurance companies. You know, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm, they're crying with five loaves of breads on their, uh, on their arms. Well, uh, well, it's also true about $20,000 for, for the emergency room. That's a lot of money that the hospital's getting that they're losing. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of fat in our system for sure. Um, and that gets that gets exaggerated in a situation like this. So fat in the system. I hope you're not making a comment about the uh, FB one and FB three here. here. Um, uh, <laughs> we'll talk to we'll talk about FB one, two, and three offline when Gibo's <laughs> around. So, um, but we're doing a little bit not just less face to face visits. We're doing other things differently. Um, tell me one thing that you're doing differently um, in your practice. Are you doing Less labs, less DEXs, less uh, less infusions. Are you switching infusions? What's the one thing that you're doing in your practice that is a sort of trim the fat sort of thing, other than seeing less patients face to face? 
I, I, I'm simple. I, I'm just doing less lab and less radiology. Uh, you know, I gave up a few years ago, I gave up all the fancy stuff, the x-rays, the bone densities and everything else. Uh, and, and you remember Jack, I called yeah. I sold the building, I, I, I went small. Uh, so yeah, that's the only thing that I see. And, and the, biggest, the biggest issue is you're actually prescribing less medication uh, to folks. And the medication side is, you know, usually you give them this, you'll give them that. Uh, you know, when we're being a little bit, I would say, I don't wanna say selfish, we're being a little frugal in what we give. And I think there's fear because we don't know what's gonna happen if we give something. We, we, you know, I think we have some, you know, trepidations. We haven't seen the patient. So am I going to give her this or give her that? So, you know. I, yeah, there's a tendency to temporize, yeah. to uh, to put off until you actually can get your hands on the patient. I think that's that's part of what you're describing. I'll tell you what we did, a few things. Um, we shut down uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound middle of March. It's going to gradually reopen the end of this month. We stopped doing bone density testing. Um we felt that was something that could be put off um, and patients probably were not going to come in for it. Um, we, we wanted to social distance for infusions. And so because there, there's very little foot traffic in the offices, we've moved prolia to the physician side. So the physician who's in the office will do the prolia injections, the abinity injections, uh, new colic as we do some, you know, allergy injections for the allergists and kept the infusions up in the infusion suite. Uh, but separated the chairs so that patients were at least six or eight feet apart. So um, these were these were strategic uh, and logistical moves. Uh, I'm not sure that they're necessarily uh, streamlining moves, it's, but it does allow for social distancing. I think the real problem would be when you when the demand begins to grow for face-to-face -face patient visits. Some of those changes that we made will need to be unwound. And uh, having one patient in the office in a six doctor office at a time is, won't fly. And uh, strategically, how do you increase foot traffic in the office when we're all so skittish about another wave of this coming back? That's the challenge. Well, what, what's your take on nurse practitioners picking up some of the slack on this via you know, telemedicine? Well, I mean, I, I think they're gonna. I think they're gonna move. They're gonna come out of the back like a horse race, and they're gonna come up into the, you know, into the fourth or fifth position and start taking over some of our business with this. Well, I personally, I think that would be a great idea. I'm a big advocate for them. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm working with a, a bunch of uh, uh, groups on this, and uh, and they have remained very active. And maybe the need for them could go up. On the other hand. You know, if people start trimming their practices for less face-to-face -face visits, they're going to trim their staff. They're going to say, I don't need more docs. Um, I don't need to hire that NP or PA like I was thinking of. So I think it depends. I think the more you're big like, uh, like I am at the university, I think you're going to hire, or, or, or a big practice like, like uh, Herbs, uh, I think maybe less um, um, new hires or, or, or that. But I think for people that are in uh, by themselves, they might see this as an opportunity, just like learning about televideo to bring on a nurse practitioner and develop that as a, another service line. Makes sense. I, on the back office functions, we found that we can manage collections, pre-authorization, our call center, and our triage people all off-site with laptops. And, uh, you know, we were, we have, we, we were expanding our footprint in terms of our, the amount of uh, real estate we were uh, renting. And uh, now we're sort of coming around to the notion that we can do it cheaper. You know, one thought is to put it in the cheapest piece of real estate. You can put it in at the lowest rate, but there's no cheaper piece of real estate than somebody's home sitting in, you know, sitting at the kitchen table. Called in sourcing, not outsourcing. Yeah. So there's another problem. There's another problem is that as you want to bring people back uh, with, with your staff, because most most ancillary staff in, in medical offices are female, uh, and they're managing their kids at home and helping them with schooling, and they can't get their childcare back in place. Uh, maybe their parents are separate, and so the the mother-in-law can't look after the grandkids. And uh, we're finding now, as we want to open up, that some of our 
some of our uh, staff can't come back because they don't have that in place. No, it's a that's a big problem. That's a big issue in my, at our center too. Um, uh, I want to, um, two more questions. One, I want to know when are you going to return to at least three full days in the clinic per week? Um, I'm not right now. Uh, I mean, I, I need to watch the numbers and know, believe for myself when it's safe, but then I have to make my patients believe it's safe. Uh, I'm projecting early June for myself, but when are you guys thinking of going back to the office and seeing patients full, full time, part time, or more than what you're doing now? I mean, from my perspective, you know, again, I own the property. I'm surprised, Herb, you guys didn't buy all property. That's how I made my money. I bought property and I, you know, and, uh, but uh, so you're Brooklyn, a good. See, you guys all left, but it, it took well, a we did. We, we did buy one office, but it, you know, when you pay rent to yourself and you have a bunch of partners who are not you, yeah. uh, they're not the recipients of the rent there, they, they pay the rent. Uh, no, no, uh, I, know. I, had two, I had two partners. We, not but, fair. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, uh, so, but when you, when you, you're, own, you're both a, a bunch of Trump wannabes, you're, you're, yeah, you you're know, real estate magnets, you're supposed to be doctors. Well, no, listen, I bought a building, I didn't know how to air rights. How did I know I was going to make all that money, you know? Oh. How do you buy a building, you don't know it have air rights. My wife found out, she goes, you got air rights here. Thank God. Uh, and, uh, and we sold it to a private school a few years ago. But anyway, uh, so I, I think, I, you know, you have to look at it. I'm going to st stay one day a week un until September. We'll see how it works out. I, I, I think in New York, uh, when I was, I was in Brooklyn two days ago, and it, it was like nuclear dust had settled on downtown Brooklyn. And it was really, you know, it was really, it was scary. You went down Montague Street, which is, you know, which is the height of Brooklyn Heights, and, you know, three or four people walking the street. So you, you, you got to play it by ear. Nobody has a crystal ball. It's what the governor says we could do. You know, Donald gave it all over to Andrew in my neighborhood. So, so. and then I got, you know, I got the best mayor in the world. Oh, so, you know. <laughs> we're, we're not. Um, <laughs> we're, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to go in until uh, probably middle of June. I'll go in one day a week. And then as, as demand increases and as I, get more comfortable and the numbers look better, I'll increase that. I'd like to be back full time. It's a very awkward time in a group um, when you're uh, my age and a few of us in our practice are, you know, we've been around for a long time and we're starting to think about retirement. How do you ease yourself out at a time like this, which, which eases everybody out, right? Um, it's very hard to figure out what to do with your life as a professional and your career as you get to this stage uh, when there are all, there's all this uncertainty. So let's end with a, a, a story of humanity or what you're seeing. You know, it's, this is a different way of dealing with patients and whatnot. And I've been um, struck by something that Artie brought to my attention, Artie Kavanaugh, um, and that is that um, in this era of and, and sort of strange communication and whatnot, the surprising thing is how humane the patient and our patients are nice they love us and they treat us well and you know they they buy us ties and wine bottles and they, they really don't have to do that but they're just so appreciative but even now it's more palpable more and and i had a patient who um i had an interrupted inter interview because and i came back so i'm so sorry i have a patient i have a friend of mine who's in the hospital in new york with the covid infection and and anyway, at the end of the visit, you know, she said, are you okay? Are you going to be okay? Are you taking care of yourself? But then she also reached back, you know, at me, you know, several days later, how's your friend doing? How are you doing? You know I mean? They're really very concerned about us. And, and I find that really amazing. Um, and do you have any similar stories from what you've done in the last few weeks? Well, I, I think the biggest issue, you know, my practice, Jack, I've always gotten all these presents and Christmas was always, you know, they're always bringing me lunch. Parmesan sandwiches, et cetera. But uh, I, I, I think what you said is the most important thing. They're worried about you. And, and my girls are telling me, my, I can't say that today. The women who work for me today, when, when they call me, oh, they want to know how you're doing, how you're feeling, doc. So I say, give me that number, I'll call them. So I call them just to say hello. Because they're concerned about me. So you give them that little extra care and they, and they love it. So really, there is a, there is a you know, an interesting... Uh, 
That's There's great. a certain intimacy about these telehealth visits. Uh, and there is, there is a lot of, you know, how are you doing? And no, well, how are you doing? How's your wife? How's, you know, how's the family? What, how is this affecting you? Where, where are you getting your groceries from? When's the last time you asked a patient how they get their groceries? Uh, so there's a lot of interchange of information uh, that's more, let's say, social and less medical. And, uh, and you know, uh, I think the three of us have been around long enough to have these very strong relationships with patients caring in the full sense. You know what, my biggest complaint about, uh, about healthcare in the last uh, few decades is that uh, care has become a euphemism for indifference. And, uh, and you feel the care, you feel, and the care goes both ways, because we, you know, patients and doctors- Feel the love again, them. Herb. It's the love you feel again, which we <laughs> lost in the past 10 years. People <laughs> like us again. We're not these gone-ups that they all think we are, that we're portrayed as. You know, so I, I really do believe. Until you, you know, start charging for the copay on the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, is, it, it is, I, I'm but it is, it is real, it's palpable. It's very, it, people, uh, People are really care about you as a person, and you can show how you care about them, and it really we does. You get to see that Dr. Baraf's an old Brooklyn Dodger fan by that cap he's got on his desk, and Dr. I, I, Ricciardi's I, I, taking care of me from his house in the Hamptons. I mean, uh, it's a different uh, level uh, uh, of intimacy. Now they, you're much more of a, of a real person, part of their family, and we've always been very family sort of oriented in the way we take care of our patients. That's what makes rheumatology so wonderful. You know, we're lucky in, in another sense. If this occurred 20 years ago, there's no, there's no FaceTime, there's no Zoom. No nothing. There's, yeah, uh, you know, I think about uh, Passover for uh, the Jewish members of the group, uh, and everyone did this by Zoom. You know, there'd be six families all together on, the, on, the, on a laptop on the dining room table, uh, eating two by two. Uh, <laughs> The, there is a lot of there is a lot of intimacy in this way of communicating, and we are all completely tuned into what's happening in the world, not just here, but in Italy and in China and you know you name it. And so the world is a very small, intimate place, and this is a great way to connect. And well, do you know that in 1969, if you guys remember, the Hong Kong flu hit America, a hundred thousand people died. I don't know if everybody's aware of that. 100,000 people. And we had Woodstock with only 220 million people as opposed to 340 million people today. And we didn't, and, and you, you, it's interesting you say that, Herb, because in 1969, we just let people die. You know, we just, we just let it ride. And you, you, you look this up, and it's so true, Jack. I know you're going to, I'm not a Donald Trump. It's not fake news here, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a real thing. But it was the Hong Kong flu. 100,000 people died in the United States. And, you know, no, and nobody knows about it. So it's an interesting, uh, like you said, because we, what did we know? We had a rotary telephone back then. You know? Also, the Mets won the World Series. And the Jets, okay. And the Knicks. And Don't the forget, that was the yeah. only time in the history of New York City where you had three winners that year. You and know, yeah. I just it's heard the trivia awesome. that, you know, with Shula uh, passing away this week, Shula was the B uh, Baltimore coach that uh, we, oh. Eubank, and the Jets beat in that Super Bowl. And Jack and I both know Joe Namath. You know, Joe, Joe's been here a couple of times. And, and you know, uh, and, and it's, uh, you, know, he, he, you know, he's got bad knees. He's got bad arthritis. And he plays golf with our friend. With our friend. They play this mini golf every day down in Jupiter. <laughs> All right, I, I want to close with this. You know, um, these are hard times. Uh, the uncertainty is very unnerving to a lot of people, and that's what we're dealing with. But we're leaders. I want to remind um, uh, you and, uh, and all of you listening that you got to stay in touch with your people. Um, you, we talked about that and how you're communicating with your people, your employees, your, your clerks, your, your records people. You wanna, they look to us for guidance and for leadership and let them know that they're going to be okay if they do X, Y, and Z. So we got to be leaders in that situation, especially amongst our staff. That's really, really important. Right. right. Absolutely. Okay. Every day in every way. Mm -hmm. All right. Just remind me, I forgot to call a patient. I got to go call All them. right. Well, you hurry up and call them. We'll close <laughs> it. Take care of yourselves, gentlemen. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Herb. Stay well. Enjoy. Stay it. safe.